Good afternoon. This is David Eastwood, uh, Geotech Engineering and Testing. How are you doing today? Um, we're going to have our webinar today and want to get the bugs out. And uh, the topic is going to be on geotechnical consideration and design and construction of at grade uh, concrete and asphalt and gravel parking lots. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we got about 150 people uh, RSVP and uh, the uh, the audience. A lot of engineers uh, here. A few architects, a couple of attorneys, a lot of people from different cities and counties. So, the interesting uh, group we got over here. Let's see. Uh, of course, I'm with Geotech Engineering. We're located in Houston. We've been in business for about 35 years, or 36 years. And uh, we do geotechnical environmental material testing in geoforensics. We've got a staff of 60 engineers, geologists, technicians, and support staff. We work all over Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico. We have our own rigs. So we can uh, respond to the projects real quickly. We get out, get job done in a couple of weeks. So if you have questions during the presentation, please uh, type in your question in the Q&A section. Then I'll try to respond as I'm going through. If you need to reach me, my name is David Eastwood. And email is de at geotecheng.com. My phone number is 713-699-4000. So we're going to be talking about commercial concrete paving. You know, if you look at the, around town, again, around Texas, this is more like a Texas type deal. Uh, you will see a lot of concrete pavement structures. Uh, they're all over the place. The Bucky's right there. Walmart. If they're heavily loaded, uh, parking facilities. This is a metro parking facility. Uh, this is the Kroger facility, a lot to 18 wheelers. Asphalt, here's a Walmart asphalt in Humble. Well, New Kenny. Here's another picture of it. It's cracked up. This is NRG Stadium out there in Houston. Got asphalt paving. Rice Stadium, Park and Drive, near Houston Airport System. Um, heavily loaded parking facilities for asphalt. It's the city of Houston, the waste uh, facility out here at uh, 59 and uh, 610 Loop. Got asphalt paving on it. A lot of buses here. Gravel. If you go to Rushi Brothers uh, auction on 59 and uh, Beltway 8, you see uh, lots of uh, gravel, parking facilities, storage area. This is the equipment holding area. One of the this is near um, Baytown, got a gravel. That's Doggett facility on I-45, got gravel parking lot. So if you got a parking facility, one of the things we do is we go evaluate to see what kind of soils we have out there. So we send our rig out there to do some borings. It's a Lone Star College. See what kind of soil we have. That's an asphalt parking lot here. Concrete parking facility, gravel parking facility. That's a gravel parking facility. Hmm. 
most of the sampling is done with this what's called a Shelby tube sampler. It's a hollow tube. We get a soil sample, push it hydraulically into the soil, get a soil sample. You extrude it like this. That's a soil. soil. We look at root fibers. That tells us depth of active zone. Roots travel to depth where there is oxygen and water. When it stops, that kind of defines depth of the active zone, usually two foot deeper than the lowest root fiber. So all of our boring logs show root fibers define the active zone depths in, a, in expansive soils. See the root fiber right there. In areas where soils are sandy, we, use, we do what's called a standard penetration test. We can't use Shelby tube because you cannot push it into the sand. So we get a 140 pound hammer, you drive it in uh, 18 inches into the ground disregard top six inches and read the bottom 12 inches. It's a 140 pound hammer. You drop it 30 inches and you drive into the soil 18 inches. It's a standard penetration test, ASTM 1586. 140 pound hammer drop 30 inches. That's a split spoon sampler. You can see the sand in there. Here's the sand. So, if the blow counts between zero and four, your soils are very loose, like you have in the woodlands and Bridgeland area. Between five and 10 is loose. Medium dense is 11 to 30. 31 to 50 is dense, and over 50 is very dense. All right, we've got a question here. What scenario of you recommend design of a parking lot without the geotechnical information? Oh. Uh, we don't recommend design of parking lots without geotechnical. As you will find out when we go through this thing, uh, geotechnical is very, very important to design of parking lots, the kind of data you want for pavement design and performance. So the soil testing for parking lots is peanuts. It doesn't cost much. And so uh, I think you should have it. Soil logging, we take a soil sample, we log it, we cut the sample at the end wrap it in foil or put it in a plastic uh, tube, give it a job number, put it in a wax box so that we don't lose the moisture. You like it, get out there, get the samples to the lab as soon as you can so that you can test it. We measure the water level. You know, water level varies across the state. It can be anywhere from five feet to about 100 feet in parts of Texas. You measure the level of water level in soils. Got a paving area, you get a tape measure and throw a tape measure in the hole. When it goes plump, that means you have hit the water. We also have what's called perch water table plus in parts of Texas. This is the areas where you have sandy soils over clay. So the water cannot penetrate into the clay. So you've got a bathtub effect. Just water sits in the sand over the clay. It's a perch water table. Condition. That results in pumping of the sandy soils. Number of borings, you do one boring every 100 foot spacing typically for parking lots. Boring depth is 10 feet. Laboratory tests, few uh, laboratory tests, the simple ones we run. One of them is called liquid limit test. At this test, we wanna know how much water we should add to the soil for it to behave liquid. We put soil samples in here, you add a bunch of water to it. And uh, and then when it gives kind of liquid, we take some of that sample and smear it here and cut a groove through it, turn this handle 20, 30 times. And when these grooves come together, we get a sample of that. We put it in a cup like this. We get the wet weight of it. You get the wet weight of the sample. You put it in the oven and dry it up and you get a dry weight of it. So we'll find out how much water is in the soil when it's in a liquid format. In this test, plastic limit test, we want to know how much water is in the soil for it to be high, behave semi-plastic. Uh, in this test, we uh, run the soil to one eighth of an inch in diameter. Then we get the wet weight of it. We put it in the oven and dry it up. And uh, we get the dry weight of it. We find out how much water is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. And uh, so, the difference between liquid limit and plastic limit. 
is uh, plasticity index. Let's see if we can make it move. Uh oh, we got it stuck here. Let's see. Uh, all right. So this is the soil PI. If the PI is less than 20, you got low swell potential. See, 20 and 30 is moderately expansive. Between 30 and 40 is highly expansive. Above 40 is very highly expansive soils. So a couple other tests we do in the laboratory. It's called hand penetrometer and tour rate. In a hand penetrometer, we take the soil sample. We push that penetrometer into the soil. We we'll read here what kind of a strength it has. In a tor vein test, we take the soil sample, we shear the torsion, and we can read here what kind of a strength it has. This is unconfined compression test. In this test, we want to know how much load you can put in on the soil to crush it. This is what we call proving ring. This is the deflection dial gauge. You crush the soil, and you see how much load you can carry. That's important for your pavement design. We we'll also run gradation tests to see if that base material or that soil material, what kind of a gradation it has. You put it and run it through a bunch of sieves. You get a gradation curve that looks like this. You see, you know, percent passing, 70% passes 5 8 inch sieve. Like for 200, it only 20% passes. So that's not very, that's not that many fines in it. So it's mostly gravel, aggregate and sand. So it's a gravelly material. Compaction, all the soils underneath the pavements needs to be compacted properly. Of course, they gotta be stabilized and then compacted. And so this is a fill material. If you gotta bring in fill, this is the on-site gumbo clay. We get a 50 pounds of the on-site gumbo clay. Put in a bucket. This is the film material sample. You get a bucket of that. You take them to the lab. If you want to raise the site, if you want to use a structural fill, typically for select structural fill, you should have a liquid maybe less than 40 and PI between 10 and 20. You don't have to use a stru select structural fill on your projects. You can just use structural fill. That could be, you know, sandy clay and uh, clay, gumbo, you can use all those. To get select fill, you go to a, you know, places like a pit. This is a sprint pit. And, you know, pit's got different soils. Here it's got sandy soils. Here you got clayey soils. So you get a, you know, backhoe and get some of that sample of the sandy clay select fill. It's a good select fill right there. And uh, put it in the back of the truck and uh, take it to the job site. You also bring samples to the lab, you dry it up, you chop it to small pieces, you add water to it, and you start compacting that soil to get the moisture density relationship. It's called Proctor test. This is a 5.5 pound hammer dropping 12 inches, three layers of 25 blows in the four inch mold. Standard Proctor test, 5.5, drop 12, 25 blows, three lifts. You compact it in the machine too, like that. And uh, this is a compacted soil. You kind of extrude it out of the mold. You weigh it and you know the volume of it because it's a four inch mold. You know the volume and you get the density of it. So this is a moisture content, this is density. So you got moisture content seven, your density is 105. Moisture content 11 is 122. Moisture content 15 is only 110. So if it's too, too dry, it's got low density. It's too wet, it's got too low density. This is optimum moisture content where you get maximum density. So your soils underneath your pavements for your parking lot should be compacted 95% on standard proctor density, which is about 115 at moisture content ranging from nine to 13. That's optimum plus and minus 2%. So if this is your moisture density curve, this is of course moisture, this is density. Your strength is highest near the optimum. So that's why you wanna uh, compact that soil at the optimum to develop the maximum density.
Okay. Another concept that you need to know about pavement design is California bearing ratio, which is, or CBR, which is defined as the ratio of comparing of the bearing of a material that you may have, maybe sand, clay, or even crushed limestone into a bearing of well-graded crushed limestone. See how, how that material compared in strength in compared to a crushed limestone. So crushed limestone, if you run the test at point inch deflection penetration, it's got 3,000 pounds. At 2.2, it's got 4,500 uh, pounds to take get 0.2 inches of penetration. So you run a California bearing ratio is a 1.95 inch diameter piston. Crushed limestone has got PBR of 100, not PBR, crushed CBR of 100. And you soak it for four days with one PSI paving load. That's the load of the pavements, one PSI. And the resilient modulus, which is used in pavement design is 100, 1500 times CBR. You compact to get a CBR sample, you get a 5.5 .5 pound hammer, drop it 12 inches or a 10 pound hammer for modified proctor. That's a standard CBR, modified uh, proctor CBR, 10 pound hammer, 18 inches drop. And you compact it at 56, 25 and 10 blows per layer, three layers. This is a modified proctor, it's a six inch mold. You compact it, you drop the sample 18 inches and you compact the sample, you, you put it under in the water to allow it to swell or shrink. See how it does settlement under one PSI pavement loading. Then you put it under 1.95 inch or three inch area piston and record the load at 0.1 inch penetration and 0.2 inch penetration. And here's the curve that you develop. So at 0.1 inch, you measure your load of about 150, that corresponds to CBR of about 14. At, at 0.2 inch, you were up there about 175 or so uh, load that corresponds to CBR of about uh, 12, 12.2. 12 so point 0.1, your, the, the unit load is 142, point 0.2 is 183. So from that, you can calculate your CBR roughly. Of, and so use a CBR of 12, that's a lower. If 0.2 uh, load CBR is less than 0.1, use the lower one, use a CBR of uh, 12. Field CBR is more accurate to run the CBR in the field. You got a drill rig, you jack it up like this. You put your beam in here, you got your load, your piston, and uh, that's what it looks like. And you're gonna jack it up against the rig, here's the jack, you jack it up against the rig, push the penetration, you measure, measure the load and deflection, and you calculate the CBR. Engineering analysis, soil types, we have a lot of clays in Texas. These are the gumbo clays, clay soils, it's a clay site. We have sandy soils. These are sand all over the place, like a beach, Galveston, this is a sandy site. You have silt, the clay size, grain size of the silt is bigger than clay, smaller than sand. This is a silty site out there in Minton, Texas. You also have gravelly sites. So we have clay, orange clay, you go deeper, you go below that, you go white, white clay, below that, you get weathered rock. This is Dallas, you get weathered limestone, it's limestone. You develop a boring log. In this case, you have from zero to two feet. Uh, you have crushed limestone. Below that, you got fat gumbo clay with PI of 64, highly expansive soils, strength of about 1,000 PSF, not very strong. And below that, you have silty sand. So... This is fill material. A lot of the parking lots are built on fill. Fill is a heterogeneous material, clay, sandy clay, clay sand. 
as long as he doesn't have organics and compacted 95% of standard proctor density, you can build your, your uh, parking lot on top of that, okay? So you can build it. Expansive soils, we've got expansive soils all over Texas, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, the red areas. Texas soils is variable. So if you're in Texas, you gotta get a soil test to find out what kind of a soil you have before you can do parking lot design. This is a map that shows that expand up to 1,500% that uh, you can get it from U.S. Corps of Engineers. If you're in Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, Beaumont, Corpus Christi, you got a lot of expansive soils. Lubbock, El Paso, Midland, you don't have to worry about expansive soils. Again, more pictures of this expansive soils in Texas and Louisiana. In Houston, for example, you got a Buffalo Bayou, north of Buffalo Bayou, soils are sandy, south of Buffalo Bayou with a gumbo clays. If you go around Houston, near where I live here, near uh, Splendora, you got uh, sandy clay and clayey sand, Roman forest, all that area has got sandy clay, clayey sand. Kingwood turns into gumbo clays in most areas. They got a lot of sandy soil areas in Kingwood, especially near Lake Houston. And then you start coming down, you go out there in Crosby and uh, well, Bellevue, Baytown, LaPorte, Seabrook, Pre Pearland, Friendswood, Missouri City, Sugarland, Pecan Grove, Rosenberg, all these areas, East Bernard, highly expansive soils. You start getting close to Katy, your soils become sandy soils, it starts having perch water tables in Cinco Ranch, Bridgeland area, you got sandy soils over clay. Fairfield, you got, you know, mostly low PI, low plasticity, sandy clays and sand. The woodlands, you got sand over clay and sandy soils. Tomball, you got sand and clays in some areas. You go inner city out of the air, you go West U, Bel Air, Tanglewood. Got lots of highly expansive soils, big trees, and a lot of attorneys live here. So you gotta watch out. Design. One of the concepts that you need to understand is called potential vertical rise or PVR. Potential vertical rise expressed in inches is the potential ability of a soil material to shrink and swell at a given density. So we got a potential vertical rise all over Houston area. For example, if you look at Houston, you go out there in Mobile, your, your, your movement can be as much as PVR of five inches. You go out here in spring, 1.5 inches. You go to Katy, one, one and a half inches. You go to uh, Friendswood, five inches. You, you go out here in Rosenberg, five, six inches. So just depending where you are, you have various PBRs. So you have to design your parking lots based on the PBR. You got to know what the PBR, otherwise you're going to have a rideability problem. And um, so if you look at the driveway here, for example, if you look at it sitting on expansive soils, if uh, if you don't account for the movement, that's the kind of a structure you're gonna have. This is a picture of a farm in Snook, Texas. That's near a &M. And you can see these mounds, they're called gill guys. It's an Australian guy who discovered it. And you see all the expansive soils heaving up all over the place over there. So when you do roadways and when you do, uh, Parking lots, you got to watch out for these things. You got to design for expansive soils. Here's a picture of a roadway. You can see how areas expansive soils swelled up. The roadway was asphalt. It's really thick. But in order to get it level, they had to go in there and mill it down so that they have a lower thickness here to make it level. So you can see that all the heat is taking place. You can see again, gumbo clay, lime stabilized subgrade and uh, crushed limestone and your asphalt, oh, it's heaving. Again, pavement is thicker here, it's milled over here. So if you look at the at station along the project, your PBR can go all of it over the place on the project sites. And, you know, and again, if you have a roadway, for example, or a large parking lot, you can see the PBR can go up and down. 
So in areas you got highly expansive soils, in order to improve viability, you may have a design PVR. Your design PVR may be one and a half, 1.75 inches. So if your PVR 1.75 inches and you have an active zone of seven feet for a soil with PI of 45, you're gonna have you're gonna need at least 40 inches of non-swelling soils uh, for a PI 45 to get it down to 1.75 inch PVR. So you're gonna to have to treat that top 40 inches of the soils and put an asphalt paving or concrete paving, lime stabilized subgrade, and, and uh, you know, treat them below that. The depth of the lime stabilized subgrade should be high. So in some projects, you may design based on what kind of a PVR you want for your pavements on your parking lots and roadways. This is a site that shows the stations versus uh, depth uh, of removal of the expansive soils, depending on design PVR of one inch or 1.25 inches. And you can see for one inch PVR, you're gonna have to take out at this station, 4,300 or so, 40, 4,250, you gotta take out about, you know, 4.75 feet of soil. You have to enter, you know, buffer zone there. In this area, you may have to have five and a half foot. Uh, to get a PVR of one inch, or if you want a PVR of 1.25 inches, yeah, you're going to have to take out, you know, almost 4.75 feet. Again, it's all have to do with rideability, what you're looking for. Uh, in order to medicate the expansive soil sites, you can remove and replace with, of expansive soils with non-expansive soils. Uh, you can do moisture conditioning. You can do a chemical injection. So, Uh, just depending where you are, you know, here's a removal and replacement. You take out the expansive soils, you put in non-expansive soils in there and compact it. Or you can do what's called moisture conditioning. You go in there and add a bunch of water to the soil, compact with 4% over the optimum or 5% over optimum. The soil is, if it's wet and you compact it, uh, it won't swell as much. So your PVR will go down. So you just call moisture conditioning. Compacted optimum plus 5% of optimum. So if this is your uh, moisture density curve, your proctor curve, optimum plus five puts you at about 16%. That's where you compact that soil and compact the soil, cover the area that has been moisture conditioned with plastic sheeting as soon as possible. If you do that, if you're making a uh, moisture condition, you gotta cover it up with plastic sheeting, otherwise you lose the moisture. You gotta cover it up with paving as soon as possible. Chemical injection, in some areas you do chemicals like sulfuric acid type materials, and you mix them in these tanks, what the the, uh, the chemical injection does uh, is called cation exchange, which removes the calcium and replace it with uh, uh, potassium and uh, uh, removes the uh, uh, sodium and potassium and puts calcium in there, makes the soil less expansive, makes that double layer of the clay smaller. See, this area is a smaller than here. It's called cation exchange. And so, uh, and also what happens is that uh, it makes these clay layers more, uh, less negative, so they don't want to absorb as much water. So your double layer in clay uh, platelets do not absorb as much water. This is a chemical injection that you in inject the chemicals into the soil. So you go out there and compile, you know, inject your roadways. The other thing you have to worry about when you do pavement design is traffic loading. What kind of loading you have? You have cars and trucks. What do we have here? You just regular cars. Your pavements do not have to be very hefty. But uh, these are asphalt pa pavements. But you've got big 18 wheelers your pavement should be pretty stout. 
So because these heavy loads, you need to have a thicker section of the pavements. So when we design concrete parking lots, design is done by ACI, American Concrete Institute, or Portland Cement Association, or AASHTO. Pavement design. This is the latest version of the ACI, that's ACI 330-21, commercial concrete parking lots, pavement design. It looks for soil data with design parameters, traffic loading, soil type, CBR, concrete strength, design life, coefficient, subgrade reaction. Traffic loading, D1-1, D1-2, Light traffic, medium light traffic, D1 2, D1 3, medium traffic, maximum of 3,000 vehicles per day, D1 4, medium heavy traffic, D1 1, 5, heavy traffic, D1 6, very heavy traffic. So, depending on your traffic loading, you know, you will have uh, different traffic loading. EAL is equivalent 18 inch axle load that we use in our design. VPD means that uh, basically vehicles per day. Uh, ACI concrete pavement design. Uh, let's see. For ACI pavement design, their traffic loading is a little different for ACI. They say A, car, car parking or areas, light trucks. B is entrance and truck service lanes. C is buses. D, traffic loading is heavy duty trucks. And E is garbage trucks. You also look at the soil. If you got clay, you got low support. Coefficient of subgrade reaction, 75 to 120 PCI. You got sand and gravel. You got medium support, 130 to 170 PCI. Coefficient of subgrade reaction. If you have sand with gravel and no clay, you got high support. And you got a support values ranging from 180 to 220 coefficient of subgrade reaction PCI. Take all pavement sections. If you have traffic loading, D1 is 5.0, 6.0 for treatment of subgrade. If D2, you got six inches concrete, six inches of lime stabilized subgrade. Uh, D3, seven and six. D5 is 10 inch and eight inches of uh, lime treated subgrade, 10 inches of concrete. If you go to ACI and look at their traffic loading we just talked about, for A type of traffic loading, you need five and a half inch. For E, which is a heavy truck, you need eight inches of 7.75. I don't understand why ACI gives pavement thickness in 0.25 inch thicknesses. Most of the forms are set up for five inch and six inch and seven or eight inch. They're not set up for 7.75. So um, it's not very accurate. This is for the soft soils, for uh, for a stronger soil, medium strength. You need five inch, five seven five, all the way seven point two five inches, which is less than this. If your soils are stronger, for category A, you need five inch, five point five, seven point five, all the way to seven inch. Concrete strength, typical concrete strength for concrete pavement is three thousand psi. 3,500 PSI at 28 days. In the waste dumpster areas, minimal concrete thickness should be seven inches. The concrete pad areas should be designed so that the vehicle wheels of the collection trucks are supported on concrete while the dumpster is being lifted to support the large wheel loading. Typical steel placement for D1 traffic loadings, number three bars, D2, number three bars, at, well, number D1 is number three bars are 18 inches. Spacing with number four bars are 24 inches. D2 is number three bars are 12 inches. Number four bars are 18 inches. 
D3 is number four bars at 18 in both direction. Uh, number D1 through D5, number four bars at 12 inches on centers, both direction. So if you have your building in here, around the building, you need to have in your pavements, isolation joints here. You have control joints. And then you have expansion joints. Okay, so that's expansion joints, isolation joints, control joints for your pavements. Control joints, ACR recommendations that control joints should be have space at a maximum space about 30 in 30 times the pavement thickness for parking lots. ACR recommends maximum control joints at spacing of 12.5 feet for five inch pavements. Control joints joints of 15 feet for six inch pavements. Soccer control joints should be four to 12 hours after concrete placement. And that depth of the, the joint should be one fourth of the pavement thickness. So if your pavement is six inches, your control joint should be one inch, one and a half inch for six inch paving, one and a half inches. So these are control joints. See the control joints for this tail wall building? These are control joints. Control joints are intended to predetermine the location of the cracks. It tells the concrete where to crack. So typical spacing for the joints. If your pavement is four to five inches, put about 10 foot spacing. Five to six inches, put in 12 and a half foot spacing. And if it's six inches or greater, at 15 foot spacing. Expansion joints, ACR recommendations indicates that the regular space could, uh, expansion joints may be deleted from concrete pavements that are their maintenance nightmare. Therefore, the installation of the expansion joints uh, is optional. Typically, we recommend, you know, at 80 foot spacing. So if you got a parking lot, here are the expansion joints. Because of the maintenance, some people eliminate them. We recommend an 80 foot spacing. Is the expansion joint. Maximum joint spacing, if you should be 80 feet. Construction joints, they provide interface between the areas of the concrete that's placed at different times during the project. Construction joints, when the concrete is placed at different times, we recommend the use of construction joints. The construction joints consist of butt joints, not keyway. The butt joints are joints without special load transfer, like a tie rod type, type deal. Uh, transfer feature for light vehicles. So this is the typical butt joints right there. The typical, basically thickened butt joints. There's no rod here, gals. But if you use heavy tra traffic loading on heavy truck parking lots, you need dowels here. Dowels for ex at expansion joints for D1 typically use uh, uh, five and an inch, five inch, five eight inch diameter dowels, twelve inch long, five inch embedment for D2, three fourth of an inch, fourteen inch long, six inch embedment. For D3, 7 eighths, 14 inch long, 6 inch embedment. For D, D1, D1 4, 1 inch in diameter, 14 inch long, 6 inch embedment. For D5, 1, eight, one and 1 eighth, 16 inch long with 7 inch embedment. Isolation joints. You got to put them around the buildings and parking lots. Concrete slabs should be separated from other structures or fixed objects, such as poles in concrete paving, or abutting the pavement areas to offset the effects of expected differential, vertical, and horizontal movements. Isolation joints are used to separate the pavement from these structures, such as light poles, bases, and buildings, and inlets. So this is a kind of a building foundation. 
you put isolation joints in here. This is a thickened isolation, thickened uh, pavement isolation joint right there. There's a tent wall building here. And uh, you got an isolation joint here between the pavement and the building. Here's the isolation joint. Here's another building. You see the isolation joint there. This allows the building to be isolated from the parking lot. You also need to put isolation joints on the manhole. This is a manhole. You put isolation joints around it. These are control joints, catch basin, isolation joint here. It's a, it's a control joint here. Okay. Here's another one precast in, inlet isolation joint. Now, curves and thickened edges around pavements. These are different types of curves or thickened edges around the pavements. It's a curve, a different type of curves. That's a typical joint out here with dowels. And uh, that's an inlet, it's a manhole. Again, you see that uh, in joint here around this uh, inlet. Manhole, this is the joint. These are control joints. It's an isolation joint. Joint sealer. The joint sealer is uh, soft and able to accommodate the concrete slab expansion and contraction. The sealer purpose is to prevent water and ice and dirt from getting into the joint, start joint pumping, and to prevent intrusion of intrusion from the below of the slab. So this is like a saw cut deal. Tells the concrete where to crack joint. This is a field joint. It's a large saw cut deal. This is one eighth of an inch. This is bigger. You fill it, put these fillers in it. Filled reservoir type deal. Here's a large one. You put a backer rod in it, then put the joint filler in it. And here's the kind that put com compression seal in it. You just put it in, it's got friction and holds in. We have in terms of joint sealants, we have four in place sealants, which are liquid sealants, like a hot polymer type, rubberized type material, or cold poured in like a silicon, or pre uh, or performed sealants, like neoprene, uh, compressed into the joint, maintain their position through a friction contact against the side, side walls of the joint. It's a neoprene. Concrete curing, where you pour the concrete for the parking lot, you got to use the membrane curing material. That mean that beats text dots, DMS 4650, uh, hydraulic cement curing materials, preventing evaporation. And you have to have good surface drainage on concrete paving. The design of construction should provide parking area that's quick driving and uh, you don't want to have a bunch of water in there. Drainage for parking lots should be at least 2%. Asphalt pavements. Design of the asphalt pavements. Usually asphalt pavement use Asphalt Institute or use Ashto pavement design. In your design, you need to use soil types, California bearing ratio and resilient modulus. Typical design for D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5 is D1 is two inch asphalt, six inches of base, crushed limestone or crushed concrete or gravel, and six inches of lime stabilized or treated cement stabilized or lime fly stabilized subgrade. For D2, use 266. D3, use 2.566. D4, use 388. D5, use 41088. 
the asphalt mix design, got to be a type D asphalt, meeting textile requirements, item 340. Specific criteria for the job specification should include compaction in an air void ranging from 3.8 to 8.5%. Base material should be composed of crushed limestone, meeting textile 247 type A, grade one, compacted to 100% maximum modified. Remember, it's modified proctor density. Add moisture contents between optimum and plus, plus 3% of optimum. Related civil design factors such as subgrade drainage, shoulder support, cross-sectional configuration, surface elevations, environmental factors, which significantly affect the service life of the pavement should be included in preparation construction drawings. Normal per periodic maintenance of the pavement should also be required. Asphalt pavements require more pavement, uh, maintenance than concrete pavements. The initial cost of asphalt pavement construction is less than what it is of concrete, but <clears throat> life cycle costs can be the same. That means during the whole life of the pavements, by the time you spend on overlay and maintenance on asphalt, essentially you spend as much money on than concrete. Long-term pavement per performance will depend on several factors. The subgrade and pavement surfaces should be designed to promote proper drainage. Install joint ceilings in the cracks immediately. Extend curbs into the subgrade at least four inches. Place low pore permeability clay backfill against the exterior of the uh, of the pavements to uh, for curb and gutter. Preventive maintenance should be planned for asphalt pavements. Preventive maintenance activities are included to slow down the rate of pavement deterioration. That means crack joint sealing and patching, global maintenance such as surface sealing. Um, so all these things gotta be done. Uh, in terms of the base material for asphalt pavements, you have crushed limestone, gravel, crushed concrete, and you should meet textile item 247. Drainage for asphalt pavements should be about 2%. The next pavement that we talk about is gravel pavements. Crushed limestone, crushed concrete, based on Ashto pavement design, National Crushed Stone Association or uh, grilled hand uh, design method if you want to use geotextiles. Subgrade should be chemically stabilized, like lime stabilized, cement stabilized, lime fly ash, or use geogrids. Flexible base gravel parking lots, use gravel parking lot. Crushed limestone and crushed concrete, meaning textile 247. Soil types, you got to know soil data. The soil data that's required is what kind of soil you have. Is it sand, clay, silts, California bearing ratio? If you don't want to use geogrid for your gravel parking lot, you stabilize that subgrade, then you put a flexible base in it. You can use National Crushed Limestone Association for your design. So if you got a CBR of like eight or 7.5 here, you go to this chart, you go come here, go to hit this line, and then go to your traffic loading. This is D4. You're going to need about 14 inches of crushed limestone on your pavements. Typically, if you have a poor subgrade, like we have in Houston, your CBR is five or less. So you're going to need about 15, you know, depending on the traffic loading, you're going to need a bunch of gravel if you don't want to use geogrid. Question, what are the boundary conditions of lime stabilization versus geogrid for unpaid subgrade uh, stabilization? Uh, I want to get to that in a minute. Just give me a second, I'll get to it. Design without the geogrid, you compact that subgrade, place design with, with a geogrid. Compact the subgrade, you place the geogrid, place the flexible base on top of it. So GH type design approach method provides a design tool to determine the thickness of the unreinforced and geogrid reinforced aggregate bases for unpaved and pavement areas over subgrade. 
Drainage for gravel parking area should be 5%. Really is important to have positive drainage on gravel parking lots. If you don't, it starts pumping and you're going to have a bunch of ruts. Trust me, that happens. I see it all the time. Construction, back in the old days, Romans used to have inspectors. If the density didn't pay, they can use the spears and stab you with it. If your compaction didn't pass, that's it. If your concrete was bad, that's what they used to do. Clear and grubbing, you go take out all those beloved trees first when you build your parking lot. All the roots needs to come out, anything more than half an inch. All these areas got to be uh, removed, backfilled and compacted in, in lifts. You can't just dump soil in, in the hole. You got to dig it out, muck it out, and put it in lifts and jump and jack it and compact it. You can't use organic material as fill materials. You got to use good soil with low organics. These roots are not acceptable. That's not acceptable pad for your parking lot. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Too many roots and organics. Not acceptable. All the organics used to come out. You take you know, take them off site. You proof the oil area. Make sure it doesn't sink. You get a loaded dump truck. Somewhere about 25 to 50 tons total loading. You proof roll it. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. 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 Area needs to be compacted. If your soils are sandy, use a steel drum roller. If it was clay, you was a you would use a sheep's wood roller. You compact that soil. Run a density test with a nuclear gauge to make sure you got proper density. That's a nuclear gauge. To, to do a nuclear gauge test, uh, what you do is um, you uh, run the test by having a probe. You run the probe into the soil, you make a hole in there, and you put your steel in it in the hole. You with the probe right there. Then you put your uh, your nuclear source in there. This thing emits photons, gamma rays. And here's a receiver here. If it's got a lot of the gamma rays coming in, that means your soils are not properly compacted. If, if there's less of it coming in photons, it means it's properly compacted, it's correlated. You compact the soil with the sheep's foot and seal it with a pneumatic. That way the water doesn't get into the soil when it rains. Again, you compact it with a sheep's foot and you go back with seal with a uh, steel drum or a pneumatic roller. Keep the water from going in. Subgrade stabilization, chemical stabilization. If you look at the textile chart in here, uh, if the soil's passing to number 200 sieve, greater than 25%, if the PI is less than 15, you would use cement stabilization or lime fly ash. And the PI has been 15 to 35, use lime or lime fly ash. If it's above 35, use just lime stabilization. Lime stabilization is a top A lime or type B lime slurry. That's what we use. Type B lime slurry for our stabilization of our subgrade and your pavements. Type B soil, uh, lime, you cure it for 24 to 72 hours. Gradation, when you pulverize that material, 100% should pass number 1.75 sieve, 85% should pass 0.75 sieve, 60% should pass number 4 sieve. Compact at optimum plus 3% when you do lime stabilization. You go out there and scrape all the 
grass and weeds, organic soils. You bring, bring type B, lime, slurry. <laughs> you apply the lime. Add water if you need to. Let it hydrate. It mixes with soil and breaks it down to clay. Developed a reaction, a pozzolanic action. You cure it for 24 to 72 hours for hydration. You pulverize it. This is a pulverizer. This is the original clay gumbo. Then you go pulverize it with lime. That's what it looks like after you lime stabilized. Your gradation after you pulverize, nothing should be greater than 1.75 inch. Your compact, 95% standard proctor density with a sheep's foot, seal it with a pneumatic. Run density test. You can also apply fennel filling to find out what the thickness of the lime stabilized grade is, subgrade is. Sometimes contractors do not put enough lime in there. So, or they put lime in a deeper thickness. So actual lime content is going to be less. This is a big deal. So if your lime doesn't have a proper pH of 12.4, you would lose all your lime stabilization. It goes back to non-stabilization. So if you got 6% lime over six inches and these guys go and pulverize and mix it in 12 inches, your actual lime content is 3% and you're, you're not going to meet the target of 12.4 for your lime stabilization. So it's very important to see if your stabilization for six inches, you don't go in there and find 12 inches of stabilization. That means you use 6% over 12 inches as opposed to six inches. That means you're not going to meet your pH requirement. So you go out there and do lime testing. You measure the depth of the lime stabilization every 1,000 feet. Density every 1,000 feet. We do it every 100 foot. Radiation every 1,000 feet. It's a lime stabilized subgrade. It's a lime stabilized subgrade. Stabilized already. You put your steel in it. <coughs> you don't want to have these cracks in there. As soon as your lime stabilized, you go in there and you don't let it dry up. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. This is too dry. When you do mix design for lime, lime stabilization, you got to get that PI less than 20, and your pH for the lime stabilized subgrade should be 12.4. You can also use this method here with the PI of the soil, it's percent soil binder. You find that for a PI of 40, you need 8% cement, I mean, lime to get that pH of 12.4. Again, if you don't meet your pH of 12.4, you lose your lime stabilization. Cement or fly, or fly modifications. For cement stabilization, you use a type C150 type one cement, or it could be dry or slurry. Add water, compact near optimum. Compact within two hours. That thing gets hard and you got to compact right away. You scrape the grass and weeds, you add water, you apply your cement either dry or a slurry, mix it in a tank. Then you pulverize it, mix it good, compact it within two hours. Make sure you got proper gradation. Compact it with the sheep's foot. You seal it with a pneumatic. Run the density, make sure you got proper density. Now, when you do lime, uh, cement stabilization of subgrade soils, especially sandy soils, uh, it gets really hard. So it can have reflective cracking problems. Reflective cracking is what happens if your subgrade cracks, it shows up through your asphalt pavements. So what happens is you go out there and get a steel drum roller and roll it back and forth. Get a usually 48 hours after cement stabilization, a steel vibratory roller passed over the stabilized subgrade. This will induce micro cracking and relieves the tensile stresses. The base stiffens and recovers. This is called 
autogenous healing. This would reduce the flat cracking in asphalt pavements. Line fly stabilization. Okay, another question here. Have you ever incorporated uh, asphalt interlayers in asphalt design to reduce reflective cracking? Yes, we have. Uh, I want to get to it in a minute too, but yeah, you can do that to reduce reflective cracking. That's very important. That's, uh, I've talked about it in my pavement design webinars, but that's a good way of doing it. Um, line fly stabilized subgrade, use type B line fly slurry. One more question. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. That must be the guy from 10 star asking that question anyway. Uh, lime stabilized type B, fly ash, type C or F. Apply lime fly ash in single mix, or you can do it in uh, apply lime, then go back, put fly ash, compact with two hours or no more than six hours after adding and mixing. You apply the lime, polarize it, mix it. Then you apply the fly ash, dry, add water, complete compaction within two hours of commencing with the compaction. When you start compacting within two hours, go in there. No more than six hours after adding the, mixing the water and uh, stabilizing agents. Pulverize it, compact it, Run density test, make sure you got proper density. Construction of uh, concrete parking lots. If your soils are sandy, you go use a steel drum roller, use vibration and compacts the sand better. Densifies better. If you got clay soils, you use a sheep's wood. The sheep's, sheep's wood compactor or clay, compact that soil. If you got a lime stabilized, you have to lime stabilize that subgrade if it's gumbo. We talked about lime stabilization. Add water if you need to, pulverize it. Compact it. Set your forms. Put your dowels in, that expansion joints. Put chairs underneath the steel. If you got wet areas, put some lime in it to dry it up. You can put the chairs in. Joints, you can see the, the expansion joints. Steel. Start pouring concrete and, and finish it. Here's a precision screed, concrete street, screed, really a good piece of equipment to have on a job. You pump that concrete, use a straight edge to straighten it. Again, you can see the precision screed in here for flatness. Precision screed. You go in there as soon as you can put the equipment on it. You go saw cut four to 12 hours to get the control joints in place. Tell the concrete where to crack. These are control joints. That's your parking lot. Beautiful parking lots, curing compounds. As soon as the hot summer months is going on or winter, or you go in there and apply the uh, curing compounds. Could be spray type, burlap, plastic sheeting. You 
Go in there, sock out your control joints. Tell the concrete where to crack. Expansion joints. You pour the concrete uniformly on both sides of the expansion joints. Okay, at the same time. Finish it, run a slump test. Your slump test should not be more than five inches. This is a cone. You put three layers of concrete. You rot it 25 times per layer. Pull it up. This is your slump from here to here. No more than five inches. This in here from the here, slump. This is 11 inch slump, not acceptable. You gotta send back that concrete. This is lump of one inch, not acceptable. Not acceptable. You know what this means? Add five gallons of water to the concrete. When you add five gallons of water to the concrete, that makes that concrete have too much water in it. Adding a one gallon of water to one yard of concrete will increase the slump by one inch. One gallon of water reduces compressor strength by 250 PSI. One gallon of water weighs 25 po pounds of cement. One gallon of water increases shrinkage by 10%. One gallon of water increases permeability by 50%. One gallon of water reduces freeze thaw by 20%. One gallon of water reduces salt scaling resistance. Uh, one gallon of water increases cracking by 10%, increases air content by 1%, increases the segregation, increases water damage from traffic, increases dusting, increases finishing time for contractors. Is it really worth the expense? And it's not. So don't add much water to your concrete. Making cylinders. Uh, you go out there and you put your concrete out there in the and this, and take it out uh, away from the construction area with the wheelbarrow. And you make your concrete cylinder, these are six by 12 inch molds. They're six inches in diameter, 12 inches high. You put concrete in there, three layers. And you rod it 25 times per layer with this rod. Smooth the top. Covers on it, leave it on the job site 24 to 48 hours. Take it to the lab in, the, in, a, in, a, in a box like this so it doesn't wobble around. Measure the temperature of the concrete. Temperature of the concrete should be between 75, 100 degrees when you place it. <laughs> When you take, make the cylinders, you take it to the lab, you keep it in a curing room, 100% humidity, and uh, keep it there seven days and 28 days. You take it out at seven days and 28 days, put it in a machine like this, you crack it, you break the cylinders. Then you go out there after 28 days of the pour, you core that concrete to measure it's got a proper thickness. And uh, you make put it in a machine and you break it. And so uh, typically the cylinders and cores don't match on the strength because the curings, usually the cores are 15% uh, weaker than uh, concrete cylinders. ACI 318 says concrete in areas represented by test. If the concrete strength doesn't pass, the strength. If basically you get three cores, it's average of the three cores is at 85% F prime C of like 3000 and no single core is less than 75% F prime C. That means your concrete passes. So if your design of strength is 3000 PSI, None of the cores should drop below 2250 and average should be above 2550. That need passes. If it falls below these values, your concrete fails. Hot weather concreting. Hot weather concreting occurs if you have high ambient temperature, high concrete temperature, 
low relative humidity, high wind speed, high levels of solar radiation. Uh, what happens when you have uh, hot weather concreting? You have increased water demand, increased rate of slump loss, increased setting, setting rate, loss of workability, develop plastic shrinkage cracks. These are shrinkage cracks. Cracks that appear on the surface of the freshly placed concrete slab during the finishing or soon after. Parallel cracks, one to three feet apart. Shrinkage cracks are rarely impaired the strength of the slab, but they are in, unsightly. Cold weather concreting. Definition of cold weather is basically no more than three days in a row. The average temperature should be less than 40, 40 degrees. The air temperature is not greater than 50 degrees for at least half a day. Okay, you shouldn't pour concrete then. If you do pour concrete and when it freezes, expansive soil surface forces within the concrete. When the concrete freezes, the water in it expands. That results in disruption of the cement paste matrix causing ir irreputable loss of the strength. Early freezing can result in a reduction up to 50% of ultimate strength. Concrete should be protected from freezing until it has attained at least 500 PSI. So make sure you put some blankets in there or heating blankets or heaters around it to at least 500 PSI. If it gets to 500 PSI, concrete that's protected from freezing uh, with a, has attained 500 PSI will not be damaged by a single freezing cycle. If you have multiple, it'll be damaged, but just a single one, it doesn't. Concrete uh, parking lot distress. You can see the settlement in here at the joint more cracking and settlement, <coughs> cracking and settlement, bird bath, cracking and settlement, separations, cracking, discolorations and, and, and really falling apart here. Construction of asphalt parking lot. Let's talk about construction of it. You go out there and stabilize that subgrade, Either lime flash it or lime it, then you bring your crushed limestone like that. You spread it around. Go to sheep's with compacted or steel drum roller. You compact it. Put a prime coat on it. Prime coat is a liquid asphalt applied. It's a liquid asphalt emulsion applied to the aggregate to prevent uh, separation and, and improves bonding of the hot mix asphalt to aggregates. Emulsified asphalt SS1 or SS1H. After that, you're going to start applying your asphalt pavement. Compact it with a compactor. Use the steel drum rollers to compact it. Gotta make sure you got a proper temperature on that con on asphalt. Check the temperature of it. Typically somewhere between two, 250, two, 300 or so, 325. Usually it ranges about 270 to 325. If that uh, temperature is too hot, you cannot have temperature of the asphalt pavements more than 350. If it's more than 350, the lighter fractions of that asphalt binder evaporates. This makes the binder stiffer and it er causes early aging. Aged binders tend to be more brittle and more susceptible to cracking. See that blue smoke out there? If the temperature is more than 350, you reject it. Don't place asphalt when it's freezing. Do not play asphalt pavements less than two inches thick. When the surface temperature is taken in the shade from the artificial heat is below 50, 50 degrees and falling. Asphalt may be placed when the temperature is above 40 degrees. 
and rising. If the temperature is too cold and you place asphalt, the mix stiffens as it cools. This makes it difficult, if not impossible, to obtain proper roadway compaction of the mix. Proper roadway compaction is probably the most important factor in determining longevity of the roadway. Every effort must be made to obtain target roadway density. Rolling pattern. When you apply your asphalt, you do out there, you roll it with a steel drop roller and you see, measure how many rolling you have to do to get to the proper density. So if you do four, four rolls over it, four times you go over it, you get the proper density. It's called rolling pattern. That's the density. So use your steel drop roller to go back and forth. You have four times, then you go with a steel drum roller to seal it. So use a steel drum roller and then use pneumatic to seal it. Pneumatic rollers with rubber tires provide contractors with better surface condition and better compaction. Check the density, make sure you got proper density. You core the pavements, that's where a lot of the contractors cheat. Make sure you got proper thickness of that asphalt. You core it, you measure the thickness. If it's supposed to be two inches, that's what it's supposed to be. Asphalt parking lot distress. This is a rocket parking uh, facility near the Bush Airport. And you can see that they didn't do stabilization of the subway. They put the asphalt on no base. You can see all the potholes. The asphalt starts failing. Your inlet. The whole thing had to be demolished. Yeah, another question here. Does coring asphalt park in live loop to reduce service of the asphalt immediate area around it? No, it doesn't. We've cored stuff for a long time. We're backfilling with a ready mix asphalt cold mix. And it lasts forever, same way, same as the other asphalt. Another question, what's the recommendations for concrete cylinder tests that come back at 2000 PSI at 56 days break? It fails. It's a large driveway and may be hard to determine the extent of the uh, bad, bad batch. It was specified at 3500 PSI at 28 days. So if you're supposed to have uh, 3,528 days and 56 days, you got 2,000, your concrete fails, they have to demolish it, take it out, put new concrete in. You see all the alligator cracking in here, asphalt pavements, and lots of cracks, too much load here, failed subgrade, construction of gravel parking lots. You bring in your gravel, want to stabilize subgrade construction without geogrid. That's your uh, crushed limestone. You spread the crushed concrete or crushed limestone. Then you compact it with the sheep's foot. That's what it looks like after compacted. You can see the gravel parking lot. Big facility there, equipment. Gavin parking lots with GeoGrid. That really saves you money. You go out there and stabilize that subgrade. Yeah, well, with the GeoGrid, you don't have to stabilize that subgrade. You compact that subgrade, you put in your GeoGrid, you push, you bring your gravel or crushed concrete or crushed limestone. Spread it out. Here's something that somebody asked earlier. If you got a typical pavement design, you got a four inch asphalt, 10 inch base on, 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 on unstabilized subgrade or even stabilized subgrade, you're going to have an EASL, ESAL of about 117,000. If you go out there and put a geogrid in there, you jump it to life expectancy to 686,000. If you go out there 
with minimal cost of construction. Minimum. Go to seven and a half inch and three inches here instead of four. You put the geo grid in there, you go to 120,000. For equivalent cost of this one, all you got to do is go to nine inch, three and a half, and put that in, you get about 350,000 ESAL. So with geo grids, increase your life of your pavements significantly. If this is your gravel, if you put geo grid in there, that will reduce your gravel requirements significantly. You can save money by using geo grid, so you don't have to use as much flexible base. Here's example number one. Our traffic loading was 0.3 times, 10 to the 6. Resilient modulus was 6,000. That means CBR of 4. Life expectancy of 20. Thickness without geo grid, 14 inches. With geo grid, 8 inches. Traffic loading of 10,000 ESAL. Resilient modulus of CBR of 3. Resilient modulus 45. Design life 20 years. Without geo grid, 9 inches. With geo grid, 6 inches. Here is another concept. It's called True Grid. They use that for parking lots. It's really a good, nice system. It's got these little uh, circular deals. You fill them up with gravel. You can use them for parking lots, equipment, truck yards, storage yards, drive lanes, roadways, fire lanes, rig sites, event parking. Pro Plus, this is really this is a little stronger for heavy loads. It also uses as detention, storage for rainwater, um, it drains the water below. So you got Pro Plus for, uh, let's see, Pro Plus for commercial paper, uh, for industrial paper, use MAC. For residential, use Eco. That's residential, that's, a, you know, it's not as a strong, there's a typical uh, paver, true grid, and you can see that. These are the parking lots. Use the storage underneath it for storage of the wastewater, or surface water storage for runoff. You can have heavy loads on it. Buses, and you can have fire lanes. We do a lot of fire lanes with true grid. Sugar is used to drive on, drain, and detain storm water below it. Sugar has a storage capacity of about 40%. This is 0.4 cubic feet of storage for each cubic foot of the aggregate. So you put your true grid in there, it's about 1.5 inches thick. Then put four inches of gravel underneath that. That's, that would be your storage. Sometimes you put drains underneath them. That's your true grid. Tra um, gravel parking lot distress. I see a lot of the gravel parking lot stresses. You do gravel without geo grid and then stabilization. You don't have good drainage of 5%. This thing fails. So it's not a good design. Perch water table. In parts of Houston area, you got sand over clay. You got to take care of that before you build your pavements, parking lots. That water just sits here. It's a bathtub effect. A regular water table could be 20 feet deep. Your perch water table is one foot deep. That just holds the water. You take out the grass and trees, the whole thing turns into a mush. Just water sits on top of it. That's a pumping soils or perch water table.
This usually happens out there in Katy, Woodlands area, north of Harris County, Montgomery County, parts of it. Auto improve the areas that are pumping. You can uh, scarify, open it up to dry, do improve drainage, use soil mixing, chemical stabilization of the soil, use fly ash, lime, removal and replacement. Open it up to dry up. If the weather allows, like we don't have any rain for a long time, you can open it up, let it dry up. That would be good. Drainage, you go out there in the areas that are pumping, Dig out these what we call uh, drainage ditches. These are what we call bleeder ditches. So put the drainage ble bleeder ditches out there at a frequency of like every 200 foot or so. Let the sands drain or silts drain. And you connect that, these bleeder ditches, to some kind of a detention pond or, you know, hole where there's water stands and just pump it out to na neighbor's pre property. You can also mix the soils. You go out there if you got a site where you can get some soils from, like detention pond or so. Get those clays out of the detention pond or uh, channels, bring it in and mix it with the sands. That makes it, uh, it does not uh, pulp as much to pulverize it or disc it. Chemical stabilization, you can do fly ash. Bring some fly ash and mix it in, dry. Or you can use quick lime, <laughs> dry hydrated lime. Don't use type B lime slurry. Um, removal and replacement. Take out sandy soils, bring in uh, other structural fill, and you compact it with structural fill. Don't use sand. Detention pond on their parking lots. We see a lot of the detention ponds are going on the parking lots around town. They use these plastic deals in here, pipe deals, like half a pipe. You put a jupe fabric underneath it. You put your pipe in there, put gravel on top of it. And use a steel, corrugated, concrete. Uh, chicken cartons, not chicken cartons, milk cartons. You cover that with the fabric, you put gravel on top of it, or concrete. Light poles for parking lots, you put joints between the light pole and concrete. Because this is fixed, the parking lot moves up and down. So you got cracking. So you put isolation joints around it. You don't need that for asphalt. Pictures, if you got good pictures of your projects, please send them to me. I appreciate that. That's, that's what makes the whole presentation good. You have good pictures. Uh, I want you to evaluate the program, see what you think of it. Um, you want to do better, send me emails with suggestions. Send me pic pictures. If you need to reach me, my name is David Eastwood, DE at geoteching.com, 713-699-4000. These are some of the upcoming programs that we have here. Um, if you are uh, not on our email list, send me your information so that I can put you in with the upcoming presentations. PDH hours, we're going to email you the PDH hours shortly, next couple of days. So it's very important to do proper geotechnical work for your parking lots and pavements. This is the original contract. This is the cost of reconstruction. It's called change order. So that's very important. Questions? Great job, David. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions?
Okay, well, I appreciate y'all's time. Uh, send me emails if you have any questions. And keep us in mind when you have projects coming up. Thank you very much.